1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to look at what Paul writes in verse 17. Two words. Pray continually. That's enough. From these two words, I want to preach using as a subject, whatever you do, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. For most of us in this room, we don't need to have a high automotive acumen to know what a spare tire is, what a spare tire does. But for the benefit of the 17 of you in the room who may not be automotively astute, permit me to begin this sermonic discourse by describing you the form and the function of a spare tire. You see, underneath all that junk that you have in your trunk, or for those of you who have off-road or sport utility vehicles, you'll find it on the back exterior of your vehicle. There's an extra tire. Separate from the four that helps you to move forward from point A to point B, and the primary purpose of this extra wheel is to allow drivers to keep moving forward in the unfortunate event that something in the road causes one of their four tires to become flat. The spare tire is so insignificant to many of us in our daily driving experience that it is very possible for you and I to go years without having to actually use it. If we engage in a moment of honesty, many of us could admit that most of the time we don't even think about our spare tire until something goes wrong. But of course, because of how it has been designed, The moment something goes crazy, we find a sense of solace in knowing that we can go to the trunk of our car and get the spare from the trunk just so that we could get out of harm's way and move down the road a little bit further. I highlight this this morning because for many of us, we would have to admit that perhaps one of the most regrettable things about our walk with God is that when it comes to our prayer life, too often... We handle our prayer life a lot like we handle spare tires. Because for some of us, it seems like the only time God hears from us is in those moments when the varying vicissitudes of life have pulled us to the shoulder of life's expressway. And we are forced to watch people pass us by. For many of us, as long as we're in the fast lane of life, we don't even think about prayer or praying or the impact that it has on our life, or the effect that our prayers could potentially have on somebody else. Because after all, we've become too busy trying to get to the destination to stop long enough to pray. But often as soon as we find ourselves in an emergency or we're about to face a little embarrassment, that's when all of a sudden we remember that we may be able to get a little further if we just pull out our prayer tire. And then as soon as we get to where we think we want to be in life, we pull over, put the prayer back in the trunk, only to be used again at the next emergency. Church, the reason why we're talking about prayer this year what Paul is because what Paul is attempting to teach us with these two words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is that prayer for the believer was never intended to be a spare tire. That you and I pull out in moments of emergency when we find ourselves in trouble. But prayer is supposed to be the steering wheel that has been divinely designed to navigate us to the right path that will lead us to a deeper, more robust, life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, if we ever desire to be deemed spiritually healthy, Martin Luther, that great Protestant father, reminds us that you and us must see the discipline of prayer as essential to our spiritual life in the same way that we see breathing as being critical to our natural life. Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we've been called through the discipline of prayer to inhale the presence of God and exhale the power of God. We do this to a dying world who is in desperate need of seeing what Jesus looks like in real time. This is what the Apostle Paul is attempting to share with us in our text for the weekend. In his first letter to the church at Thessalonica, Paul begins to share 
with these new believers in Jesus Christ, how they should live their lives in view of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He tells them then that because, Jesus, because of Jesus Christ, they are no longer children of darkness, but they are rather children of light who now have what it takes to live a life that would be pleasing to God. And because they've been equipped, ladies and gentlemen, with what it takes to honor God, Paul in chapter 5 closes this letter by giving them some final instructions on how they're supposed to use their new equipment. So in verses 12 through 15, he instructs them on how they are to engage and interact with one another. Listen to what he says in verse 12. He says, honor those leaders among you who are working hard for your benefit. He also urges them then in verse 14 to encourage those who are disheartened. Help those who are weak among you and be patient with everyone. And finally in verse 15, in Eugene Peterson's message translation, he commands them to be careful that when you uh, <laughs> to be careful rather that when you get on each other's nerves that you don't snap at each other. But in those moments, look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring out the best concerning those around you. Friend, if those aren't reasons to pray, I don't know what is. Then he switches gears, friends, and moves from talking about the church's outward activity to describing how they should interact with one another. He begins to focus on their inner attitude. And he gives them instructions, the instructions for which they were intended to develop and improve their intimacy with God. So when we get to verse 16, 17, and 18, we find Paul telling the people of God that in order to consistently experience the power and the presence of God in their everyday life, these are the things that you ought to do. Rejoice always. Pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. And listen to what Paul says. Paul says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The, these three verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 are a companion picture. That we should always be, I'm sorry, that we should always be present in the life, that should always rather be present in the life of every true believer. Because every follower of Christ should bear these things as distinguishing marks as a result of their relationship with God. I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. Because Christ has died, because Christ was buried, and because Christ was raised on the third day, there is always a reason for you and I to rejoice. Because Christ died. Because Christ was buried and because Christ had rose on the third day, there is always a responsibility for us to pray. Because Christ died. Because Christ was buried and because Christ rose from the third day, there's always a reason for us to give thanks in all circumstances, even when it feels like we don't have reason to give thanks for all circumstances. And so the relevant question relative to verse 17 is this. When, when, when Paul invites us to pray continually, what, what is he actually referring to? Well, I'm glad you asked because I figured y'all would ask. When Paul invites us to pray continually, he's not just suggesting that we should spend all day constantly reciting prayers. This is not the call to walk around mumbling prayers under our breath all day long. He's not saying that it's God's desire for us to spend every waking moment of our life on our knees in prayer. In fact, if you can remember, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, he speaks out actually against the routine of praying. At least the routine of praying that is absent of the point and absent of God's power. Listen to what he says. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward that they're ever going to get. But when you pray, Go away by yourself. Shut the door and pray to your father in, pub, in private, rather. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. 
And so when Paul calls us to pray continually, he is saying that in our conversations with God, we ought to maintain more than just the proper activity of prayer. He's actually talking about developing the right attitude. One that's not afraid, watch this, to leave the phone receiver off the hook. So that in the event that a need arises throughout the day or in those moments where we find ourselves reflecting on the goodness of God, we want to express appreciation, we can do that. God is constantly trying to talk to us and so he tells us pray without ceasing. Because this is more than activity, it's about attitude. Because the truth of the matter is this, there may be times when we may not be able to engage in the action of prayer, you know, body bowed, knee bent, eyes closed. But we should always have a prayer in our hearts because as one theologian puts it, prayer is appropriate in any posture, in any attire, at any time, in any place, and under any circumstance. And so Paul says, pray continually. So what does this look like? I think he invites us to pray continually as a means to exercise our dependence. Somebody shout dependence. Our dependence on God. Hear me and hear me well, friends. Prayer is an admission that I am not God. When I pray, I am admitting that I am not God. God, the best and most practical way to live the life of dependence on God is to make the discipline of prayer a central activity in our lives because it is in prayer that we discover our ravenous need for God. Pastor Clark quoted one of uh, our friends, Pastor H.B. Charles, and in his book, It Happens After Prayer, he says, pray without ceasing is not merely a suggestion for the believer. Prayer is our Christian duty. Because it is an expression of our submission to God as well as a picture of our dependence on him. In other words, when you and I go to God in prayer, we remind ourselves that we are infinitely impotent and woefully worthless to do anything without the power and presence of God at work in our lives. Because the Bible declares it is in him that we live and move and have our very being. It is because of God who holds us up and it is because of God who gives us the strength to go forward so when we pray we're acknowledging how big God is in comparison to how small we are but often the challenge with with acknowledging the incredible strength of God is this when I acknowledge how strong God is I have to also acknowledge the ways in which I'm weak and for some of us we don't do too well with that because we see weakness as a liability so often when we come to God in prayer, we come to God in prayer then like a businessman engaging in some cutthroat negotiation in the boardroom of a corporate office instead of going to God like a father. We go to God with our need and we present it to God in prayer. Then we wait on God to make a, his best offer. And like a shrewd businessman, we consider what God is telling us to do and for many of us, we don't sign off on the deal too quickly because we want to keep our options open. Just in case God doesn't do what we want him to do. But church, when you and I embrace prayer as a lifestyle and we pray continually, we don't engage God based on what we have or what we know because we recognize that everything we are, God made us. And everything that we have, God gave it to us. We understand that everything that we know, it was God who taught us. And where we are in life, it was God who brought us. And so the call here is not to engage God like a businessman, but to engage God like a baby who goes to their daddy and acknowledges just how much we need him. We come to God with our hands empty, knowing that we don't have anything to offer God, and yet we rest in knowing that if if we, though who are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our Father in heaven know how to give us good gifts? Prayer is about mastering our dependence on God. Somebody shout, I need God. Come on, now say it like you really need him. Say, I need God. Stories told of a father and a son um, one day who, who was on a hike. 
and um, on a bike ride, rather, together, Pastor Jennings. And, and as they were riding down the trail, the father sees this huge tree branch in the way. Instead of riding around it, the daddy chooses to use this opportunity to teach his son a lesson. They pull over and the daddy says, hey, move that branch out the way, boy. The boy pushed and he pulled. He pulled and he pushed, but the branch was too big for him and he couldn't move it. After trying and trying and trying and trying, the boy yells to the daddy, daddy, I can't move it. Daddy looked at the son and said, yeah, you can. Just make sure you're using all your strength. Hearing what his daddy said, little boy tried harder, pushed a little harder, but it seemed like the more he pushed, the weaker he got. So frustrated and almost in tears, the little boy yells back to his daddy, Daddy, I told you I couldn't do it. Daddy said, did you use all your strength? The son said, yeah, daddy, I did everything I could do. Then the daddy looked at the son and said, stop lying to me. You didn't use all your strength. You couldn't have used all your strength because not one time did you ask me to help you. <laughs> Friend, when you and I go to God in prayer, we are saying to God that this thing that I am carrying, this life that I'm attempting to live is too big for me to move. And I realize that I can't do it in my own strength. I need God to step in and clear the obstacles that are in my way and make the path straight can I ask you this weekend what do you need God to do for you whatever it is I guarantee you can lean into the one who cannot be moved but who has the power to move everything in your life but it's going to require that you and I remember that he is God and we are not and because we are not God the best thing that we can do is place our dependence on a God who is faithful and cannot fail and so Paul says don't stop praying but use prayer as a way to express our dependence on God but he also says don't stop praying because you need to use prayer to express your desire for God. I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. While on one hand, prayer provides us with an opportunity to let God know how much we need him. For some of us, we need to see prayer as an opportunity to let God know just how much we want him. Because at, at, at its basic, most fundamental core, prayer is just conversation with the creator. That's it. That's all. It's, it's through prayer that our love and desire for God is renewed and rekindled. And in, it, it enables us to grow more intimate with God. Let me see if I can make it live for you. I hope I got three people in the room who can be honest. Do you remember the first time you fell in love? When was it? Was it grade school? Middle school, high school, college. Somebody saying, love, what is that? <laughs> I'm still looking, right? Fellas, you remember when that pretty girl in your third period class used to sit in front of you and she slid you her number? You remember that girl? Now, don't, don't say man too loud if you sit next to your wife, <laughs> if she ain't the girl. <laughs> Do, do, do you remember when you called and y'all hit it off so well that before you knew it, it was 10 o'clock and you missed going to the park, playing basketball with your boys, you forgot to do your homework, you almost got your butt whooped because you didn't take the chicken out the freezer because you were so caught up <laughs> in the conversation. And the only reason that you got off was because your mama came in the room talking out loud, talking about how, uh, talking about how you got, ain't got no business running up her phone bill. Because you don't have no job. But because you were in love, you didn't really care what anybody had to say, including your mama. Fellas, do you remember being so caught up in that person that you were talking to so long that you were willing to risk everything, including getting your butt whooped at times, just for the chance to talk to that person again? You know what I'm talking about. No, you hang up. 
No, I ain't sleep. Mm -mm, I'm not. Uh uh. I ain't, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, how, how, about, how about on the count of three? We hang up. One, two, three. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is the kind of desire, friends, that God is looking for us when we pray. And friends, even though the word of God commands us to pray, you and I should not see prayer as something that we got to do. Sure, it's a command, but prayer is not something that merely we have to do. Prayer is something that we get to do. Think about it for a moment. Every time you pray to the Father, we are talking to somebody who's too good to even be in our presence. And yet day in and day out, God is waiting by the phone, waiting to hear from you and I. And some of us, we've been hanging up too soon. And, well, and what we're called to do in this season is to engage in the, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. Because when we pray, we are expressing a deeper desire to intimately know God. This is why Joseph Scrivens would say, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so we pray continually as a way to express our desire for God, to express our dependence on God. But I want to say that the reason why you shouldn't stop praying is because when we continue to pray, we become exposed to the direction from God. Prayer reveals more than our desire. Prayer is an invitation to embrace God's desire. We pray continually because we want to marry our desire with what God desires. One of the great truths of our lives is that you and I have no real idea where we're going in life. Sure, we have specific desires for what we want to do and where we want to go. We have ideas for who we are destined to become and for the impact that we desire to leave on the world. But at the end of the day, we really ain't got no clue what our future holds. And this is why praying regularly is significant. Because every time we come to God in prayer, we position ourselves to receive a new set of directions for the journey that is ahead of us. And when we become exposed to God's directions, here's what we're saying. We're saying, I want God's will, God's way. And yet, when I look at my own life, what I've discovered is that for many of us, the reason why prayerlessness is so pervasive in certain seasons of our lives is because we get the feeling that, <laughs> that praying is going to cause God to call us to do something that either we're not prepared to do or he's going to ask us to do something that, frankly, we just don't want to do. So we choose not to pray because we're scared of what God going to tell us to do when we pray. But Paul says, I want you to pray continually. And embrace God's will, God's way. Because in the words of that sainted member of our church, Papa, Book, Papa Brooks, Son, the reason why you can take direction from God is because while you can't see down the street, you serve a God that knows what's going, around, what's going on rather, around the corner. If, if you've ever been to a parade, you know that often because of the crowd, you have limited views of what's going on in the parade. You can hear what's going on, but you can't really see what's going on depending on where you are in the parade. Because... From your vantage point, you can only see what is passing directly in front of you. And while you're enjoying what's in front of you, you really don't have no idea of what's getting ready to come down the road. It could be a pretty float. It could be a horse. It could be a band. However, if you ever want to experience a parade in all of its beauty, go higher. Go to the top of a building 
Because from that vantage point, you're able to see the parade in its entirety. You can see the beginning, the middle, and the end all at the same time. And can I tell you, church, while you may not be able to see what God may be asking you to do next, when you go to God in prayer, you can go to God with confidence, knowing that the God who is giving you the directions is the one who is not just standing in front of the parade, but who sits on top of the parade, and he can see the end from the beginning, so there's nothing that catches him by surprise. I close with this. Jesus helps us to close the sermon this way by illustrating the importance of how prayer eases the tension that many of us experience when it comes to receiving directions from the Father. Jesus says in John chapter 8 verse 29, I only do what pleases the Father. I'm going to give it to you again. Jesus says, I want to live my life in such a way that the only thing I'm going to commit to doing is what pleases the Father. Which then begs the question, how could Jesus know what would please the Father every day? You want to know how he knew what would please the Father every day? It's because he took time to talk to the Father every day. So Jesus serves as our model for prayer and praying. In fact, when you study the life of Jesus, it's, a, it's no secret that Jesus was in constant communion with the Father. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, that he got up early to pray. Early. That's the one I'm struggling with, Jesus. Because <laughs> I'm more of a mid-morning person. I tried that getting up early stuff. It didn't work that well for me. I slept in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> But for Jesus, he was committed to getting up early. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 says, praying all, he prayed all night before he chose his 12 disciples. He spent the entire night before in prayer. Before he chose the people he would do life with. John chapter 11, you know this. He prays before raising Lazarus from the dead. Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, 14 and 15. We find Jesus praying before he laid hands on the little children. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, he prayed that Peter's faith would still remain even after Satan asked to sift him. And I believe that it's sufficient enough to say that Jesus was not, only, was not only an excellent example. I believe, rather, it's sufficient to say that Jesus is an excellent example to follow when it comes to praying well. Jesus, in my estimation, as I push toward the close, is what I would call the ultimate prayer warrior. Not the prayer wimp, the ultimate prayer warrior. Who found delight in always going in the direction that God wanted him to go. And perhaps the greatest illustration of this is found in Matthew chapter 26. So by the time we get to Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is at the the cusp of fulfilling his purpose in the earth. And while we have documentation that proved that he was a healer to the sick and a raiser of the dead, a feeder of the multitudes and a teacher of the disciples, do not get it twisted. The reason why he came was so that he could be the savior of the world. And he knew this. But it seemed like the closer he got to actually fulfilling the assignment, the Bible tells us the more agony that he experienced. And so he finds himself at a point of tension between what his flesh wants and what God wants. And so he declares in a prayer to the Father, Father, I know the plan that we discussed regarding my purpose for saving the world, but Daddy, if you got a plan B, listen, it's the time to pull it out now. Whether you realize it or not, Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 illuminates the tension that takes place in all of our souls. Every one of us at some point has questioned God when God called us to do something. We've asked, do I really got to do this? But Jesus correctly deals with the tension of the duty between, uh, uh, he correctly deals rather with the tension between duty and desire. And he helps us to understand that we've got to learn how to make our duty, God, our desire rather, God's duty rather, our desire. We've got to learn how to make our duty God's desire. 
And so listen to how he closes the prayer in Matthew chapter 26. He closes the prayer. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus prays in Gethsemane, he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he gives us a simple but strong reminder about prayer, and that is this. When we pray, we've got to remember that at the end of the day, God is the one who is in charge. Prayer is all about God accomplishing his will on the earth. It is not about accomplishing our will. The ultimate purpose of prayer is for God and his glory, not us and the fulfillment of our needs. E. Stanley Jones in his book, Liberating Ministry from the Success Syndrome, says prayer is about surrender. And he gives this illustration. He says, if I were to throw out an anchor from a boat and catch hold to the shore and begin to pull, am I pulling the shore to me or am I pulling myself to the shore? Think about it. You, you in the middle of an ocean. You trying to get some solid footing, some safety. You throw your anchor out and you begin to pull your boat. Are you actually pulling the shore to you? Or are you pulling yourself closer to that which is solid and cannot move? And this is what prayer is all about. Prayer is not about pulling God to do my will, but prayer is about aligning my will to the will of God. And church, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus took God's direction because had he not taken God's direction, he would have never gone to Calvary. Had he not decided to go up that skull-shaped hill, our souls would never be served, saved. Rather, Church, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus said yes to God even when God said no to him because had he not died you and I would not be alive right now you and I would not know what it means to experience the goodness and the grace of God and so friends I want to invite you like an intermittent cough you know how it is when you have a cold and you can't stop yourself from coughing and you don't plan on coughing, but it just, uh, it just comes up. That's, that's how I want you to see prayer because that's what it means to pray continually. Everybody stand to your feet all over the church. We're going home. What a great reminder and a great call to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and to surrender at another level in prayer. I want to invite somebody to take prayer and praying more seriously. And for somebody here, as you think about your prayer life, perhaps you've been seeing, particularly in light of the fact that we've been talking about prayer at the level we've been talking about prayer, you've been seeing prayer merely as a command. But I want somebody here to see prayer as an invitation to deeper intimacy with God so that you can get the necessary instruction to live out what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you to grab hands with somebody if you feel comfortable, if you don't, fist bump them. I want everybody touching somebody as we pray. When you think about prayer, how many of you would say, I, I, I see prayer, I pray because I need God. I pray because I need God. Somebody else, I pray because I love God. Somebody else, probably, perhaps you're saying, I pray because I need to know what it means to pursue God at another level. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so very grateful for the privilege of prayer and praying. And God, we thank you for the reminder that we are called to live a life of prayer. That prayer is not just something that we do in our heads, but something that is attached to our heart as we do our best to try to live for you. God, we really do want to love you better. We really do want to live for you better. We really do want to know what the next step in our journey is. We want to surrender to you at another level. And so, Father, I pray that as we engage this week, that we would make it our business 
to see prayer not merely as a spare tire that is attempting to get us out of emergencies, but to see prayer as the steering wheel that guides every area of our life, that guides every conversation, that guides every post that we're going to post, that guides every DM we're going to send, every text message, every phone call, every meeting this week, that we would leverage prayer not just for moments of emergencies, but to leverage prayer not, in, not just in moments of disappointment, but in moments that matter, including every moment. Thank you for your word and for the reminder of the significance of prayer and praying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're here this weekend, yeah. If you're here this weekend and you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you before we start moving. Before we start moving, that wasn't a closing prayer. That was just a prayer prayer. That was like the post-sermon prayer. I'm going to give the closing prayer in just a minute. But before I do so, I want to invite somebody into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been praying for your life to change. And God says, I led you here today because I want to lead your life. I want to lead you into a life that is more fulfilling. So if you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to make heaven your eternal reality. If you're on site immediately following this service, we've got our brother Deacon Kevin Enders to my left and your right and other members of our spiritual decision team who will help talk you into, or not talk you into, but help to explain to you more about the decision that you made. You want to make that decision, you're on site, room 145, right out the door to my left and your right. And if you're watching online, you can dial the number that's on the screen. Or maybe you want to be a part of this church. We'd love to be your brothers and sisters in the faith. Our pastor would absolutely love to be your pastor. Same thing. On site, room 145. Online, 877-632-0702. You want somebody to pray with you, to model for you, or to connect with you rather than intercede with you about something in your life. Same thing, 145 or watching the number on the screen. Well, aren't you glad you came to church today? Will you help me praise God for Michael Ward?